We are going to start um, our, our last keynote speaker. First and foremost, I, I just want to really thank you. Can you can hear me? OK. Really? Usually I'm talking too loud. Um, so uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for the hard work you just did uh, in the session we just had. Um, we're going to talk about this in the next panel, about some of the themes you've identified. Um, but uh, I could tell that there was some really good conversation going on uh, in that discussion. Uh, and I want to assure you that all of these comments are going to appear in the final report from, uh, from the conference. So thank you very much for that. Um, in the mid-20th century, uh, there was a famous poet shortly after the Holocaust who made a comment to the extent that there was no poetry after the Holocaust. In the early 1990s, I had the privilege of hearing another poet who said, no, after the Holocaust, there is nothing but poetry. And last night, uh, Ben Slomoff uh, entertained us with um, a quote from a very important poem uh, from Yeats that I think in many ways about the center not holding, that in many ways encompassed much of what we're trying to talk about today. So I think it's, it's a thoroughly appropriate um, that we have asked uh, a poet to be our last uh, guest speaker in this conference because in many ways I think only the eye of a poet can really understand many of the issues we've been trying to grapple with and can express it in ways uh, that those of us in academia who are a little less poetic <laughs> in the way we write um, do not express I think as effectively. Um, so let me just quickly read you uh, Eliza's bio here. Eliza Griswold received a Guggenheim Fellowship for her ongoing work on water and poverty in America. Her first nonfiction book, The Tenth Parallel, was awarded the Anthony J. Lucas Prize and was a New York Times bestseller. Her poetry, her poetry and reportage has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, among many others. She's held fellowships at Harvard University and at the New America Foundation. Her collection of reportage and translations of Afghan folk poetry, I Am the Beggar of the World, will be published uh, this spring, and with a second collection of her poems to follow. It was the 10th parallel, I think, that many of us uh, in this room read uh, that certainly caught my attention and others, looking at the division, uh, the, the great division between both Islam and Christianity, but other religions as well in that part of the world that initially led us to ask her to come speak. But as you can see from her bio, there are many other aspects of her work um, and, art and artistry that I think are of great relevance. So please join me in welcoming Eliza Griswold. Thank you, Darren. And I just want to say thank you all. I'm really, really honored to be here and to be with you today. And I have to give a huge shout out to Imam Shafa, who's here with us today, who I ran into probably the first time, I don't know, 2006, 2007, uh, in Nigeria, in Kaduna. I think I was wearing pajamas. That's what I used to wear when I would <laughs> go report because I thought, well, no one will really recognize their pajamas and they're baggy and respectful. Everybody knows when you're wearing pajamas. So I met uh, Imam Ashafa and James, uh, Pastor James in Kaduna, and saw what I still to this day has been the most effective interfaith work in any conflict situation ever. And what is it, what does it entail? to start with an idea of solution, what I saw them doing, which I have not really seen elsewhere with this effectiveness, is to draw women in expressly into a conversation about how to build peace and to bring in a third issue to the work they were doing at the time I first visited them was they were, they were buying stoves. They were buying, one of the things that Christians and Muslims fight over in northern Nigeria is firewood, dwindling resources, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But these guys had gotten their hands on some low wood-burning stoves. So for a typical woman in Nigeria who's, who's feeding her family, it costs about a dollar a day to buy enough wood to, to cook. Well, if you can cut down on the amount of wood you're using over time, you're going to A, do better things for the world, better things for the environment, but B, you're, you're going to 
pay less. So these guys had worked out a situation whereby Christian and Muslim women were owning, co-owning stoves, sharing stoves, and in that one, it, you know, in the stuffy conference room on what the seventh floor of a cement apartment built or cement office building with no working elevator, there was community rebuilding around a third issue. It wasn't interfaith dialogue where Christians and Muslims were sitting there looking at each other saying, well, I believe this and you believe this. No, it was them looking together at a common problem, a problem that had nothing to do with religion. And that I would just offer you up front as one of the most successful community organizing. You know, this has happened on Sri Lanka with, the, with organizing trash pickup in Sri Lanka. So those of you who are actively engaged in post-conflict or to reduce tensions around your communities uh, in terms of religion, I would suggest that you go nab that fellow sitting there and ask him how in very, very practical ways he's managed to help keep a peace in a city that would has been one of the greatest tinderboxes in terms of violence, religious violence, around the world uh, until this work really began. So. With that, I'm going to step back a little bit and say thank you again. And today we're going to talk, my mandate today was to bring to you a conversation about a little explored, what kind of emerging religious uh, fault lines are we seeing? What are some of the underreported pieces of what's going on along them? Um, where are they? And I spent seven years traveling along one of these religious fault lines in Africa and Southeast Asia. I wrote a book called The Tenth Parallel, which is an examination of the space where Christianity and Islam meet uh, across most of inland Africa and also across farther south due to the trade winds across Southeast Asia. So I'm going to read to you a tiny, tiny, I'm going to read to you a paragraph and then open it up for a conversation. And I think there will probably be a lot of questions as to what's going on now, and we can address those. And we can also talk about solutions. And I know there's some poets in the audience, and before we get into a hardcore geopolitical conversation, I'm gonna recite one poem, which is not mine, but belongs to a group of Afghan women who are illiterate and trade these poems called land days um, from person to person. And I've been, if, if I slip into a conversation about poetry, it's because this book just came out and I've been hawking it all week. But <laughs> here's just one poem for those poets I can see sitting back there. When sisters sit together, they're always praising their brothers. When sisters sit together, they're always praising their brothers. When brothers sit together, they're selling their sisters to others. It's a little, you could laugh more, it's encouraging. Okay. All right. So I am going to take you to this line of latitude, 700 miles north of the equator, and I'm going to read to you a little bit. We're going to talk about what's going on there and, and talk about how this, this encounter represents some of the larger tensions we're seeing between religions. Um, and conflicts that have absolutely nothing to do with religion, but have other causes that look like religious from far away. Okay. The chief was spending Easter Sunday in his hut, which smelled of stale smoke from a cooking fire and of something more glandular, panic. When the visitor from Washington ducked inside, the chief, a man in his mid-50s named Niol Padwat, rose stiff-kneed from a white plastic lawn chair he had spent several days keeping watch against an approaching dust cloud kicked up by horsemen and jeeps. It would mean his village of Todaj, teetering on the fraught and murky border between northern and southern Sudan, was under attack again. He was grouchy and unkempt, his eyes pouched, his salt and pepper beard scruffy, his waxy green and yellow shirt stained with the tied lines of dried sweat. This was the 10th parallel, the horizontal band that rings the earth 700 miles north of the equator. If Africa is shaped like a rumpled sock with South Africa at the toe and Somalia at the heel, then the 10th parallel runs across the ankle. Along the 10th parallel in Sudan and in most of inland Africa, 
two worlds collide. The mostly Muslim Arab-influenced North meets a black African South inhabited by Christians and those who follow indigenous religions, which include those who venerate ancestors of the spirits of animals, land, and sky. All right, so this is this very particular space in Sudan. And since I wrote that, Sudan split on the 10th parallel between North and South. And of course, we have South Sudan as the newest country on the planet. And sadly, we have divisions and wars continuing in Sudan now along the same fault line, but wars that have much more to do with resources than they do with religion. And that's one of the themes we're gonna talk about today. So the first thing that I'd like to say and make sure that we come away from today's discussion, the most important religious conflicts of our time are not those between religions, they're those inside of religions. They're struggles between Christians and Christians, Jews and Jews, Muslims and Muslims, and I could go on over who has the right to speak for God and why. We see this in our own context here in the US in terms of culture wars, the role of homosexuality in churches, uh, different aspects of, well, what, what does God say about X, Y, or Z? These conflicts worldwide, these contests sometimes turn violent and they are the most important tectonic plates shifting in our time and they're most frequently overlooked. They don't make the news. So I'd like to start with that as a point of departure and just talk to you a little bit else about what's going on along the 10th parallel now. So the 10th parallel across Africa, where I'm gonna focus my conversation today, is where the dry north meets the wet south. Quite simply, this is where Islam stopped its southern spread by the 1800s. Because traveling over the northernmost third of Africa, the, the Muslim traders and missionaries who carried the faith south traveled over the Sahara Desert, over trade routes, and got as far south as the 10th parallel, where the wet sub-Saharan jungle began, where the equatorial region began. Well, where the jungle began, so too did tsetse flies. And the tsetse flies carried sleeping sickness. And the sleeping sickness killed off the camels and the horses. The Muslim traders and missionaries were riding to carry the face south and carry trade south as well. So for that very practical purpose of geography and weather and bugs, that is really where Islam stopped its southern spread. And t still today, across most of inland Africa, when you look at the map, where that dry desert turns green, that really marks the southern place where the, where the Muslim world really ends. And now what's changed along that, in the past hundred years, what's along this line, there's been an explosive growth of Christianity. Now Christianity, any good African Christian would tell you, and I'm wondering if there's somebody here who would tell us the story, him or herself today, any, any good African Christian will tell you that there has been Christianity in Africa since 37 AD. That, that the book of Acts tells us quite clearly that a Sudanese eunuch who worked for the Kandaki, Sudan meaning land of the blacks, like Ethiopia, uh, that a, that a treasurer, basically a man who worked in the treasury, traveled to Jerusalem. And while he was in Jerusalem, he, what, he picked up a book in the market. He picked up the scriptures and he was riding in his chariot toward uh, the Jordan River. And the apostle Philip saw him, saw him in his chariot. And the Holy Spirit came to Philip and said, hey, ask that guy what he's reading. And Philip leapt forward into the road and said, what are you reading? And this is the book of Acts, I'm paraphrasing so elegantly. But then so, and the, the Sudanese guy said, I'm reading this book, I don't understand it. Well, then Philip baptized the Sudanese eunuch in the River Jordan. And the eunuch, and this is not in the Bible, but this is the understanding, uh, this is the African understanding of the story, that eunuch then returned uh, and became the first the first missionary among his own people. And so that really, and that's a very, very important story to understand the context of Christianity in Africa today, especially in this region where Christianity and Islam come into contact and sometimes conflict. Why is that important? Well, one of the, one of the pieces that underlies this these tension that runs along this belt is that for centuries, the, the black Africans who lived south of the, right on that border, south of the Muslim world, were enslaved. And 
Christianity became a form of self-expression and defense against slavery. And so in this way, this language that we say, well, this, this fighting between Christians and Muslims, this, this is very violent and this is expressly, they're using holy texts and the Christians are just as violent, if not more so, using these books. What is that about? In a lot of what we need to understand in the historical context, that has to do with the, with the history of, of slavery in this area. But that's just one of the historical pieces. Today, what we're seeing along this belt where dry North Africa meets this southern wetter belt, we're seeing profound climate shocks. We're seeing dwindling resources and growing populations at rates faster than most other places in the world. At the same time, this confrontation is compounded by the fact that this is one of the most sensitive environmental bands on the planet. Here, it's to give you a sense geographically, it's not one specific line of latitude. It's not just this hor horizontal band 700 miles north of the, of the equator at all. We're really looking at 1,000 miles just north of the equator and all the way up into really into the Sahara, that transitional space where dry meets wet, and people are being pushed off their land. We see this across Africa. We see this, most recently, we're seeing this in Central African Republic, where we hear absolutely real stories of Christians and Muslims killing each other these days more violently than in the past. Why? Largely, this has to do with being displaced off of land due to climate change. So, as most of us know, the Sahara Desert is creeping south. The land is drying up. And what that means is that farms that were once viable and also lands that were viable for, for cattle, for pat, pastoralists, guys with cows who travel nomadically, that land is no longer viable at all. And so where do people go who have been keeping cows for centuries or having small farms in this belt, but mostly we're talking about nomadic pastoralists who also happen to be Muslim? They push south, they have to, they have to reach water. And that southern land, as you move towards the equator, that southern land is settled land, and that southern land is Christian land. And so we have, we have nomadic, mostly Muslim pastoralists, herders, pushing into land that has for the past 50 years certainly, seen an explosive growth of population and faith. So we have these very vibrant, very effervescent bands of Christianity, Christian farmers coming to blows with Muslim herders. And what does that look like from far away? That looks like fights between Christians and Muslims. So I spent these seven years traveling from west to east through Nigeria, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, then over the Indian Ocean into Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, looking at what happens when these two faiths meet and they come to blows in political elections, in fights over water, electricity, when they come to blows over things like crops of chocolate. Because one of the things in Indonesia that Christians and Muslims have come to fight over is cacao. When global prices of chocolate spike, so too has violence between Christians and Muslims. So, the first and most important fact I took from this journey was exactly what I started with, that the most important religious contests of our time are those inside of religion, not between them. We see this in Africa, we see this in a competition and a confrontation between older forms of Sufism and newer forms of Islam coming from elsewhere. Uh, we certainly see this, we see this throughout this belt of the world. We, Sunni Shia, none of these are surprising to us, but it is essential to understand that these are the true contests. I also came to understand that there wasn't one conflict I, I witnessed that was only about religion. Every single one had some kind of secular driver, and that could be, that could be and was most frequently about politics. And so what was that? Well, partly what we're seeing along this belt as well is that the states 
These are states that were never supposed to exist. This is a post-colonial, these are lines that colonial administrators drew on the maps, arbitrary borders that separated people from their families. And so, for example, to be a citizen of Central African Republic means nothing absolutely nothing. What kind of rights are safeguarded by your government? None at all. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, your state isn't stealing from you. But if you're not lucky, your government is rapacious. You don't have the right to electricity. You don't have the right to school. You don't, all, all ownership of land is passed through laws that don't make any sense. The level of corruption is extremely high. And in most countries where there is this encounter between Christianity and Islam, the colonial history is seen as expressly Christian. So turning to Islamic law, turning to precepts that predated the arrival of Christianity and the arrival of colonialism is an idea, an impetus born of returning to a purer time, a time where there was not this corruption that frequently we see people believe and frequently is tied expressly to colonial practice. So now we've looked, at, we've looked at what's happening along this underexplored band with the weather. We've looked at what's happening with political weak states and why being a citizen of a state means nothing. You, you turn to other forms of identity. And more and more you turn to religious identity, not ethnic identity. Even more so than race today, the idea of being a member of a faith group is the principal form of identification for most of the world. Now, why is that? Why is this such a powerful identifier? Well, in most of the places where I've worked, this has both local and global importance. And I'm gonna to refer to a minute to a Shabbos hometown of Kaduna, a place where the neighborhoods, last time I was there, the neighborhoods were referred to not by local names, but by international names. The Muslim neighborhoods, Baghdad, Afghanistan, the, um, the Christian neighborhoods, Haifa, Jerusalem, inexplicably television. I, I never figured that one out. But the idea being that religion, religious identity, when there is no other identity to safeguard even the most basic rights to school, to your children's future, to nothing, to electricity, to clean water, religious identity provides a group within which one can negotiate for those rights locally, and also religious identity in our increasingly globalized world provides a platform for for a sense of a deep sense of belonging that locates the self not only in a marginalized corner of the world, but also in a global story. And that's essential because everybody wants to belong to a global community and not be just an outlier. Or if they feel like an outlier, how can I make sense of myself as an outlier in terms of the most powerful force on earth? And that force is God. The other thing I'd like to say is too frequently we, I'll, I'll say I, but the community, I, I, I work for non-religious, I work for secular magazines. And I became a reporter shortly before 2001, before September 11th. I was in New York on that day. Uh, I had just done my first story for the London Sunday Times. Uh, they sent me down to the World Trade Centers, and two weeks later I was in Pakistan, you know, with those same sneakers on, with the dust from the Trade Centers in the places where the Taliban had been born, trying to confront how these tectonic plates moved, how these ideological plates had come into such violent conflict. And I was determined to debunk the clash of civilizations narrative, because it's not true. It's too simple, and it's not true. And one thing that I noticed quickly was the easiest, one thing that I, I certainly have heard many people guilty of, especially in the places where I work for, there was a desire to explain away belief and explain away God almost universally. Well, these are poor people. They're not really educated. They believe in God, right? It, there was this constant devaluing of faith as if faith were something we would all grow out of. And that is not happening. The opposite is happening. So one thing I would call for us to do today is to, you know, 
in our desire to find places of coexistence. It's too easy sitting far away from, from contest. It's too easy to gloss over real divisions and say, well, we all believe our own thing and why can't we get along? Those divisions are important. And th at one of the tables I was sitting at, there was a call to how do we, how do we acknowledge our divisions and speak across them despite the divisions. So common ground meaning not common ground and like, well, we all believe what we believe, let's get along, or all, or all of our gods are the same. Because the truth is for many of the people, and I'll just speak to Americans right now, the, the many of the people we really do need to speak to as Americans, um, that's not what they believe. And so our call to kind of soft pedal ourselves and soft pedal religion because we don't really believe it anyway, really ends a conversation before it begins. So I'm just gonna make sure that I've given you guys, I wanna give enough time for questions. We've got about half an hour more. Um, I could read to you a little bit more, but I could also open it up for questions and I feel like in this, I feel like I don't have to sell you on the idea of religion here in this room. <laughs> so I think instead of going on and on, I'm just gonna make sure, okay. Well, I will also tell you, I didn't get into this yet, but I've just returned from North Africa again and also Central Africa. Um, and I wish I could say that, you know, this book, The Tenth Parallel came out in what, the 2010, I think. And, you know, when I started reporting it, my, what I really wanted to do was look at Christianity and Islam across cultures and across continents because these two monolithic approaches, this idea that, you know, there's one Christianity, that there's one Islam, they were so blatantly misunderstanding. There is no single thing as Islam. There are many Islams. There is no one Christianity. There are many Christianities. So I traveled among different people in order to explore how that actually practically works on the ground. I hadn't thought that the confrontation would be so real. I didn't know the history of how uh, colonial powers had come in across, along this line, and I didn't understand the power of climate change at that time and how it's particularly affecting this belt. And more and more and more, the, I cannot stress how dire the situation is. Uh, in both Niger and then in Central African Republic where I was last week, one of the principal drivers, this belt of destabilized people runs across Africa, and this is the group we're seeing. This is Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. The, some of the most violent expressions of Islam are coming, which are not expressions of Islam. Let's say the guys borrowing this very convenient cloak of being a terrorist today, right? This, the, most of these people are coming expressly out of climate change, crisis born by climate change, because both drought, desertification, and extreme flooding are happening along this belt in Africa. Um, and it's just, it's essential to understand this and to see how there is no single driver to this confrontation. Like, it would be far too easy to say, oh, violence between Christians and Muslims in the t along the 10th parallel is caused by climate change. It's not a full enough picture, but it's an extremely important factor to what's going on. And, um, and as opposed to taking you guys into one little microcosm of, of I, can, I can tease that out. People want to hear more about how climate change is actually causing actual conflict on the ground. I'm happy to take us into that. But now let me just recap to say the most important conflicts of our time in terms of religion are not those between religions. They're those inside of religions. They are the contests over who speaks for God and why. And there is no such single thing as Islam. We know that here in this room. There's no such single thing as Christianity. So how to restore context to any conversation and, and any constructive conversation is to speak in particulars. And third, I'll just return, I'll bring us full circle and make reference to Imam Shafa. The most effective interfaith work that I have ever seen is interfaith work that does not sit down around a conference table talking about scriptural differences or scripture at all. It is 
Women sitting in a hot, stuffy room where the electricity has gone out, figuring out across religious lines how they're going to share a stove, how that stove is going to cost them less money, and why they are going to tell their sons and husbands not to fight anymore because the neighbor's wife actually owns the stove and they need the stove tomorrow. Building those kind of secular community bonds I believe, step by step, will really is, is part of the solution that we're seeing uh, to these globalized conflicts. So thank you very much. Yeah, Joyce. An affirmation and a question, so thank you very much. The affirmation is that um, some of our research showed that there are places that say there are 41,000 different denominations of Christianity around the world. So that's quite a number. Um, the question is also about demographics. In the US, one in five today, and it is a growing number of people, are considered secular, non um, atheist, agnostic, spiritual, not following a traditional religion. That number is holding globally, as I understand it, as well. So while I agree with you that the power of religion is a huge force, I think we will also be seeing, and I'd love you to comment on it, the power of the non-believer as another conflicting force in various places. I, I've never seen that. You know, I mean, I, sometimes, one of the most frequent questions I get when I go to talk about this book is people say, well, what kind of secular women's groups did you find on the ground doing X or Y or Z? And now, caveat being that I was traveling to places where there has been conflict. Um, but in terms of secular NGOs really working on some of these issues, or people, there certainly we'll see with the growth of cities, I mean, mega cities, there's so many forces here, forces of modernization, which will challenge traditional forms of belief. But the truth is, I'm not, I, I have not seen that borne out on the ground at all. So it's an interesting idea, and certainly, you know, if you think about Nigerians, you think about maybe Nigerian kids coming to Harvard, <laughs> you're looking at a secular base there. But, you know, I think it was President Obasanjo who said, God is Nigerian, you know? I, I don't think we're gonna see a, a, an explosive growth of secular-based um, forces really anytime soon. I haven't seen it happening. Um, thank you very much for a very enticing um, informing presentation. I just have a little bit of adjustment to add to uh, what you said, and that is in relation to the issue of Christianity and Islam, uh, because one of the things that we have noticed, and I did some work in the history of uh, conflict in Africa, um, the colonial powers, whether it be in Germany or France or Belgium or England, they met resistance fiercely from Muslim communities. And so they had what was known at that time closed districts that they imposed on the areas where no Islam was allowed in, and so it was devoted completely to the missionaries. Uh, now, as far as the slave trade, the brutality that was taking place in the West African context, and also along the coastal lines of Africa, were mainly perpetuated by Christian merchants and, 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 and Europeans. And um, most of those people who were subjected to um, slave trade, especially from West Africa, even who ended in Brazil or in uh, the Caribbean or in the United States, um, majority of them were Muslims. And, and so this is just a small adjustment that you might need to, to put because I don't think drawing the line as strictly as you did uh, do, does justice to this issue. Actually, the closed districts began <coughs> expressly along the 10th parallel. That was the line in 1904 that, that the British said, 
guess what? So the, the, you're exactly right. So the British in particular faced the greatest colonial, anti-colonial movement that they did at the hands of Islam, at the hands of the Mahdi. Uh, and so when they were able, thanks to the Maxim gun, to come back and retake a million square miles, they were really expressly concerned about facing another rebellion at the hands of Islam. So one of the things they did was to say to Christian missionaries, guess what, you guys? You are not coming north of the 10th parallel. That's that route, that historic route of the line that, that I'm using, actually comes from colonial literature. So that what became closed districts was expressly there in Sudan. Even. I'm afraid I can't actually hear. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, much you better. You can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, actually, one of the fascinating things about the whole resistance to colonialism in Africa, if you take in the north, Abdel Qadir al Jazeera, uh, Omar al Mukhtar in Libya, Dan Fodio, uh, Sultan Rabih, Sidi Mohammed Abdullah Hassan in Somalia, Mohammed Ahmed al Mahdi in Sudan most of the rebellious resistance to the colonial rule was from Muslim, uh, and they usually used to be teachers. Uh, and that's used to be very, what? Teachers. E teachers, they teach teachers. children. Absolutely, and I'll tell you right now, one of the concerns about, one of the concerns, there's been, there's an express movement among a particular group in North Africa now to recall, to pretend that they are cast in the model of Don Fodio. So this idea of these absolutely, the, the, of, of reliving the 19th century jihad is absolutely alive and well in North Africa today. That's exactly right. Uh, thank you very much. I just have a... Yeah, request from Darren. Imam Ashafa, could you introduce yourself? Could everyone introduce themselves? <laughs> OK. Uh, my name is Mohammed Noreen Ashafa. I'm the co-executive director of Interfaith Mediation Center in Kaduna, Nigeria. I have two questions, madam. The first one is, with your experience of what you've seen with your observations, comparing these two forces, the secular force on one side represented by the civil society and the academic institutions, secular academic institutions, and the faith-based motivated organizations, views, and the madrasa and all these Islamic institutions on one side, or Christian, African, indigenous Christian institutions on the other side. If you look at it, if you are to put a score on the line, do you think the secular, reorient, the secular orientation is taking hold with investment on Africa, or the faith-based approach is taking hold on the continent of Africa? That is one side. And then secondly, is what do you think is the motivating factor that most of our research team and most of the theories that have been developed today, their theories debunk of removing religious flavor, religious origin, of some of this theoretical framework. Why is it that it has been removed? Why is it that if anybody from here went to do a research, not everybody, most of those who went to research are across this parallel line, is it because of the experience they have in Europe or the American experience that make it difficult for them to acknowledge the role religious figures have played in building bridges? There are many of these religious divas at that particular time, who have built bridges across the divide, from here even up to Southeast Asia. Why is it so difficult that most of those research are not interested in that? Neither are trust and foundation, including academic institution, are investing in finding out what are those elements within that sustain religious institutions in Africa and Far East, and at the same time become a tool for social re-engagement in building bridges across. Why are they, there are no investment in that direction from your own little experience? Okay, so I'll, I'll try with both of those. I mean, in a way, it brings us back to Joyce's question. With this, this is a real tension. This is something I think is one of the most <clears throat> living aspects of, of 
This is one place that I see that the United States and the United States, our government abroad, is doing its best to play catch up and learn. Is, is it, okay, first of all, this, the importance of civil society. In many of the communities we're talking about, we've, the, the idea of a federal government is, is, has failed. Now, does that mean they won't be a state? No. But let's look at Central African Republic. Does it mean anything? Is there, there's no national legitimacy to, the, to being a citizen of Central African Republic. So then what kind of leadership exists? So one of the things that, that the U.S. is doing now is really trying to, it's a, it's a military term sometimes, but State Department uses it too, key, le key leader engagement. Right? This is something we did in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere as well. We're trying to, who do we talk to in this community who is, you know, the, the Amir of Wasse, right? Like who do we, who are the old school guys who actually have lived, lived in this community? So, so that is an effort right now. That is a very, that idea of where does civil, where is civil society? How can we engage civil society beyond just going to, illegitimate corrupt dictators or religious leaders we can't really understand. There's a lot, and this gets to your second question. My understanding of it, and again, as a journalist, so this is not my express job, but I have seen on behalf of the US government a lot of anxiety, understandably so, of engaging the wrong players when it comes to religion because they don't understand it. So, and who do you know whose contacts are, like, okay, this guy seems like he's a moderate Muslim, but where do his contacts go? I think there's fear of engaging the wrong people, and there is also, there's a bias. There's a bias against religion, as if religion is somehow soft or illegitimate. And that kind of gets back to my first point. How do we help shape our thinking here in the U.S. to understand that faith cannot be explained away. It can't be grown out of. If you get a new car, it doesn't go away, right? How can we start to, and I'll just tell a really sh brief story on that. In Eastern Congo years ago, I was driving late at night to go visit some, some pygmies. And, you know, I got into a conversation with the driver about homosexuality, as you do late at night on a Congolese road, right? And the, and the driver, who was a Christian, said to me, you know, that, he said, you may have brought the Bible here to us, but you left it here with us, and it's our time to take it back to you, right? And I, th I think I'm gonna let that story speak for itself, you know? D yeah? yeah? Yeah. Hello, um, Jane Parpart. I teach in the PhD program on global governance and human security. Yes. That's housed in conflict resolution. I have a comment and a question. The comment is, just thinking about this role of religion in the world, I wonder if we need to add to the conversation the huge populations that are in, in China, that, are, that build their lives around Confucian and Taoist notions of how to live, Hinduism, Japan, where there's very little Christianity, so there's huge, huge parts of the world where neither Christianity nor Islam are that important. And I wonder if they don't need to also be brought into the conversation. But that's not I didn't for spend you. seven years that's there, so I can't tell you yeah. yet. <laughs> right. uh, my question is, I, I was very interested in your saying about the role of women in beginning, in doing some of the kind of negotiations that can possibly lead to new ways of organizing life in a more peaceful and and uh, diplomatic and, and uh, forgiving way. And I was wondering about the role of men in this in, and the role of, in your experience, have you found that the, the women trying to negotiate with the men over the realities of sharing cook stoves and being more, more uh, open to collaboration, have you found resistances or has have there been men that have been willing to see this uh, push to create a more, more generous, more open kind of world? Have, have I they seen been men? Have you seen men joining in this in, in a way 
envisioning a new way of living that includes new ways of mm -hmm. men and women mm -hmm. relating to each mm -hmm. other? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. So, so what I was doing, you know, I'm going to quote Lam and Sane, who I, is a wonderful theologian, um, who lo has looked at the, the borders, religious, is talking about religious borders essentially, and saying that the places we see the future of religion are, are along its borders because, so if we're looking at the border of the Islamic world essentially, Indonesia, I don't know if anyone read the piece today in the Times about, there's a piece in the, in the New York Times today about uh, the, the failure of political Islam, the, the popular failure of political Islam in Indonesia right, world's largest Muslim country, world's largest Muslim democracy, what's going on? So political Islam, the, the po political, the, the Islamic parties have lost popularity. At the same time, the more Indonesians than at any other point would define themselves as faithful Muslims. So that just speaks to the variety of voices and approaches. Um, and certainly I think if we're looking at the borderlands, you see men who are willing and uh, to work along with women for another way of life without any question. Uh, very funny, I was in Dallas last night and talking about women, Afghan women, and, um, and a man in the audience said, so you, we can't generalize about women, but it seems to me you're doing a lot of generalizing about men. So <laughs> anyway, I, of course there are men willing to do this work um, as there are women, so. Uh, David Steele, uh, Brandeis University, and worked in many places in the world on conflict issues. I want to thank you very much for actually filling me in on some parts of history I didn't know. Um, that's not often the case, so I really want to express appreciation. There are two things, two issues I've heard you say what sound like opposite comments on. I think you've probably integrated them, but I want to specifically address those. One is you really elaborated on how important religion is in so many parts of the world in, in great detail. And at the same time, you talked about religion not being the source of the conflict. We have to really look at climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it not true that we're talking about multiple drivers? And the question becomes, how do they all fit together? That's one issue. The second is, you said at one point, the major issue today when it comes to religion is within religions. And yet you spend an awful lot of time about <laughs> the conflict in Africa between Christian and Muslim. Mm -hmm. And my question there is, is the reality not more complex than mm. either or? Mm. And is it in fact more complex than just looking at those two types of religious conflict? Does it not involve a whole lot of things when religion is combined with ethnicity in some places or political ideology in other places or a whole theology, actually, that is um, cosmic, that really sees the battleground as spiritual up here, and we're just sort of implementing the whole thing down here. So are there not a whole lot of ways in which religion becomes a factor, and are there not a whole lot of different drivers that, in fact, have to intersect? And we need to, inter we need to understand the whole picture. But I'd like you to elaborate on what you think. You're right. I, I can't even elaborate that much more. You're right. There are lots of their religion. You're, there, it plays such a com complex role. And so, I mean, you're absolutely right. Is that re re reductive, what I said? Absolutely. That, so how to get to, I didn't talk too much today about the division within, uh, the, within faiths because part of that is based around um, this idea of, of cultural wars within Christianity itself, uh, which I write about in the book, because my own frame of reference for uh, divisions within, within the Christian community, comes from a personal experience, which I write about. Um, but, and so, and because my dad was, my dad is retired, but he was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and it was his job to consecrate Gene Robinson, the first openly homosexual bishop in New Hampshire. And when he did that, underneath his vestments, he wore a bulletproof vest. 
And the understanding wasn't that some Muslim fanatic was going to come racing out of the crowd. It was that a fellow believer, a Christian, who took such issue with his sense of God and right would kill him for that belief. And so that's how very real these conflicts within, even within our own context, because I think it can be easy. It's certainly easy for me to be like, okay, Sunni, Shia, okay, that's somewhere else, right? Or that's, that's an identity difference. But looking within the tectonic plates of Islam, okay, this is, a, can, is, is, is the Quran open to Reformation? Is it not? Is Reformation the wrong word because it comes from a Christian context? Those kind of debates over doctrine, uh, they're very, very real. And I do write about them to some extent, but I did take us on more of a geographic trip today. And you are absolutely right that, that the ways in which religion, ideology, cosmology plays into being, and therefore both coexistence and conflict are irreducible. And this is just one narrative I took us on today, but you're absolutely right. Don't I'm, ask a hard question, Charlie. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm Charlie Sennett, and I'm a co-founder of Global Post and colleague of Eliza's from the field. Uh, Tenth Parallel, as I've shared with you, is like, it is an extraordinary book. It's, it's a really great book. Those of you who haven't read it, it is, uh, it, it's, it's so powerful, it really changes the way you think about these issues. I wanted to ask about, a, um, go right into the issue of um, the divisions within the different religions and how they play out in the conflict, and specifically look at the money that is pouring into fueling the conflict along the Christian-Muslim divide, which comes you know, largely from the big evangelical church in the United States, Pat Robertson and others will pour money into Nigeria, for example. But you also have money from Saudi Arabia, from the Salafists pouring in on the other side. So within that, looking at the, the division within the religions, the fundamentalist moneyed powers that be within those two faiths are somehow fueling the conflict. I wanted to ask how much you've observed that. Like, where, where do you see that on the ground in your recent reporting, and how do you how do we uh, all in this community work at getting the message out more about that? So, <laughs> so the easiest place to see that for me, driving along, if you're in your car, is, is the proliferation of mosques, right? That uh, not all mosques, and again, Everything I say is going to just be qualified because I'm, I'm trying to speak as specifically as possible out of only what I've seen. So, which you can see from Kyrgyzstan to anywhere, right? Now, two other factors, in addition to Saudi money now, we're looking at, especially in Africa, we're looking at Libyan and Syrian, we're looking at, so, so kind of soft Saudi money is not a thing of the past, but it's not even what we need to worry about anymore. You know, we've got, we've got arms flows coming in from, Li from Liberia, from Libya and Syria, foreign fighters returning from both places along, along the 10th parallel to North Africa, fueling what we saw last year in Mali, fueling this uptick of Al Qaeda, Al -Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. So, Okay, so the soft Saudi money that we kind of think of from madrasas in Pakistan, that's kind of not gone, but that's secondary now to the actual arms flow. Yeah, does that make sense? And on a Christian side, I was in Uganda last week, and so, you know, Museveni just passed this ridiculous anti-homosexual bill, and as a result, the United States had suspended gosh, you know, less than a billion dollars, but, but tens of millions of dollars in aid that used to go to the Interfaith Council um, of Uganda and also went to Museveni, it's Museveni's parties. So the question being, so how does that play itself out? In a Christian context, sometimes for me, it's really hard to know because certainly in Nigeria, we have this mega church phenomenon, this prosperity gospel and, you know, the, this theme that we have here in the United States too, but it is, it is louder, as I've seen it in Africa, which is 
what, if God is your father, what kind of father wants you to be poor? Your father wants you to be rich and give me money for my Mercedes and I'll give it back to you tenfold. Um, so the degree to which that, be, that has a role of foreign funding, or it, it's, it's certainly diaspora money, in the same way, you know, Al-Shabaab, the, the terrorist group in Somalia, one of the serious sources of funding is the diaspora community, the Somali diaspora community. So again, when we're looking at funding sources, it's, it's starting to change a little bit from like just like evangelicals or Saudis. It's starting to be, and probably always was, but this is just becoming a bigger factor itself, diaspora communities, arms flows from Africa itself. And then, and then from a Christian context, the truth is I don't know. I don't know to what degree what looks like African money is African money in those situations, if it's come home from abroad. Um, it's a really good question and one, especially in the context now of the growing uh, anti-homosexual movement along this belt bears more investigation. Hi, my name is yeah, Jeff Cox. Jeff Cox, and I'm actually I'm an Episcopalian. I know your dad, a phenomenal presiding bishop, when he, uh, and uh, also uh, Lama here, and I have quite a bit of theological training. Um, there's two things I just wanted to say. I, your ta your words speak about the embodiment of, of, of religion. We're talking about it from the head perspective, but there's also a heart perspective that's equally as important. That sense of joy and enthusiasm and love that comes in, in many religious communities. And I, I, you know, I, it's easy in a conference to forget about that sense of enthusiasm that can make things happen, that can bring joy and, and, and at times division. I, um, but here's my question, and, and this is not necessarily your area, but I'm, I'm curious. About a month ago, I opened up the newspaper, and I saw there were 50,000 uh, Hasidic Jews in New York City marching down Wall Street on a Sunday, uh, protesting about uh, Jew, uh, Hasidic Orthodox Jews in the uh, military in, um, in uh, Israel. There were similar protests in Israel. How do, how, here's my question, how do countries that ascribe a religious belief, like Israel and Judaism, how do they deal effectively, in your opinion, with interreligious conflict? Oh man, I am not wading into that one. Israel, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's a good question and it's, it's not for me. Uh, how, how do countries, yeah, that's a fraught one and I, I don't feel qualified to speak to it. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ngusu. I'm a PhD student in the Global Governance and Human Security Program. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. Just a couple of uh, questions. One is uh, regarding the, the, the source of conflict in the tense parallel. According to your theory, um, the tense parallel has been where religion has been a major driver um, of conflict. Uh, and now climate change is happening, and what we just said, some religious group of people advancing on another religious group for resources. I think um, when it comes to conflict over resources, I can tell you the case in, in Ethiopia. Uh, it's not about religious affiliation. Wherever there is resource scarcity, regardless of religious affiliation, people would tend to move from one place to another place and kind of create conflict. So religion, the role of religion in such kind of resource scarcity driven conflict is not that great. This is one piece of information I would like to give. The second is about the story of the African eunuch you, which you just mentioned. I read uh, about 20 versions of the Bible and that eunuch is from Ethiopia. <laughs> and you <laughs> said he's from Sudan. I, I'm just curious which African legend or which version of the Bible you read. Okay. Thank you. So 
It's absolutely true. I, the, I hope that the first comment was made clear in my talk, to be honest, that resource scarcity makes people fight, that religion comes into it later. I think that was clear. And Ethiopia and Sudan, um, both meaning, I understand that Ethiopian Christians believe that the eunuch came from the land of Ethiopia as it is today. Uh, and the land of Sudan historically, also meaning land of the blacks, right? Right? Ethiopia, land of the blacks in Greek. Sudan, also meaning land of the blacks. The larger area, there's Sud Sudanese and, and Ethiopian can be used interchangeably historically. But I understand that as an Ethiopian, you are right, he was Ethiopian. Okay, with that, I think I'm finished. Thank you. On behalf of the, the, the department and the college and the university as well, just want to thank you again for a, a great talk. Thank you. And we're, we're hoping to see you back here again very Thanks, soon. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. One more round of applause for Eliza.